Good afternoon. It is Tuesday, 3.45 p.m. And I've got your video lecture for this week. And we've got two topics we're going to talk about. One is the 1850s and what's going on right before the Civil War. And then I'm going to briefly touch on the Civil War too. I'll tell you right now, I'm not going to cover everything that's on these PowerPoints. Because if I did that, this would be a two hour long PowerPoint. And as I have been doing, I want to try and keep this to 30 minutes or less. So the first topic is going to be sectional conflict. I just want to take a brief look at what's going on in the world prior to the Civil War. And by world, I mean, you know, the United States. Uh, first item is the Wilmot Proviso. This is the attempt to deal with all the land gained by the United States after the Mexican-American War. Um, the land that today is New Mexico, Arizona, Utah, um, Nevada, basically the entire American Southwest. The Wilmot Proviso is going to suggest that all the land gained from Mexico remain free of slavery, but it never passes because it cannot get through the Senate. The response to that is the idea called popular sovereignty. Uh, this is really championed and, and supported by a guy named Frederick Douglass. And the idea was just to let the people of states and territories choose whether they want to be a slave territory or slave state or a free territory or free state. And it looks like a good solution, but as you'll find out here momentarily, it's absolutely not. We have a new political party known as the Free Soil Party. It was an anti-slavery party that is going to be started in the late 1840s, early 1850s. And slavery is going to become the number one issue that's spoken about in the 1850s. In 1850, California applies for statehood and it wants to be a free state and when that happens, um, it's going to upset a lot of people because up to this point, there had been 15 free states and 15 slave states. Uh, Henry Clay is going to propose the Compromise of 1850. And in the Compromise of 1850, Henry Clay suggests that California come in as a free state. Slavery be taken away from Washington, D.C., but the Fugitive Slave Law would be enforced and the Fugitive Slave Law would be strengthened to allow uh, slave traders and uh, bounty men to return any runaway slave without questions. And then to settle the deals with Mexico, Mexico would get paid for land that it lost. It would receive compensation. And then New Mexico would choose slavery or freedom based on popular sovereignty. So there's a lot of different working options within this Compromise of 1850 by Henry Clay. There's an event called Bleeding Kansas, and I have a couple different slides on it, but let me just kind of tell you what happened so I can speed past it. In 1854, the Kansas-Nebraska Act is passed and it becomes time for Kansas to organize as a territory. And to do that, they have to set up a government, a constitution, and everything else. When it came time to do this, there were a lot of people who wanted Kansas to become a slave state, which should have been impossible because it was north of the Missouri Compromise Line of the 1820s. To try and make everybody happy, Senator Stephen Douglas from Illinois is going to say, why don't we just use popular sovereignty and let the people choose? So it looks like it's going to work out, but the, the uh, temporary government of Kansas is going to start using some of the laws from neighboring Missouri. One of the laws from neighboring Missouri that's used uh, is going to make it illegal to speak out against slavery. 
And then another law that's going to be used is going to make it a capital offense, meaning you could be executed for this. Uh, if you stop slavery um, bounty men from collecting runaway slaves. Obviously, that's going to make the people who are anti-slavery angry. And fighting is going to break out in Kansas over this. Now, at the same time that there's fighting going on, Kansas has to come up with a working constitution. And the first draft of the constitution basically says you can have a little bit of slavery or you can have full-blown slavery. There was no option to choose no, slavery should be illegal. The anti-slavery faction The um, anti-slavery faction is going to um, boycott that election. Stephen Douglas is going to say it was an unfair election and force a second election to happen. When the second election happens, it completely undoes the first election and there's a lot of trouble in Kansas. By the time it's all said and done, there's violence. Almost 100 people lose their life. A guy named John Brown and his four sons take things into their own hands. And um, John Brown's a very, very radical abolitionist and is going to drag some pro-slavery people out of their houses, tar and feather them, and then kill them. So, like I said, there's a couple different uh, slides here on Bleeding Kansas. Make sure that you look at those. Finally, Kansas becomes a state in the year 1861 after the South secedes from the Union. The next topic is the election of 1860. There is going to be a lot of drama around this election. There's um, two different political parties. One is called the Know Nothing Party. And the other is called the Free Soil Party. The Know Nothing Party is a party of anti-immigration, anti-Catholics. The Free Soil Party is anti-slavery. Um, you put them together along with anti-slavery Whigs and you get the birth of the Republican Party. So your first Republican Party candidate runs in the year 1856. It's John C. Fremont. He's going to run against Millard Fillmore, who is the sitting president, who is a Whig. And then the Democrats, they're going to nominate James Buchanan. When the election is all said and done, Millard Fillmore, the sitting president, is defeated like by a humiliating number. And James Buchanan, who never even brought up slavery during the election... Uh, he's the one that becomes president. All right, so the presidency of James Buchanan, it's not very good. He tries to ignore slavery completely. That works out well for him until the Dred Scott case. What happens in the Dred Scott case is that Dred Scott, who was a slave... Um, his owner dies and Dred Scott sues in court saying that he should be free. However, um, the Supreme Court is eventually going to rule against him and say that slavery is legal. Slavery will be protected. After this, we got to talk about Abraham Lincoln. Um, Abe Lincoln 
is going to be um, oh, how do I want to say it? He's not destined to be president. He kind of has a a rough growing up. His mom dies at a young age. He moves around a couple of times. He joins the army in 1830 as well. And um, he becomes a politician. He becomes like a state representative for the, the state of Illinois. Eventually, though, he's going to run for the Senate. And he and Stephen Douglas are going to debate seven different times all throughout the state of Illinois. While Lincoln doesn't win, it gets his name on the board and people really start to pay attention to him. And when the Republican Party is looking for a potential candidate for the 1860 election, Abraham Lincoln is at the very, very top of that list. When we get to 1860, there's not one, not two, not three, but four different candidates. Abraham Lincoln, who is the Republican candidate and the free soil candidate. Stephen Douglas is going to be the Northern Democrat. He's all about popular sovereignty. He doesn't necessarily protect slavery. He just, you know, uh, wants people to be able to choose. Southern Democrats are going to choose a different guy. They're going to choose John Breckinridge, who was the current vice president. And then the fourth and final person is John Bell, who just completely ignores the topic of slavery and tries to, um, you know, to say, why don't we all just get along? Basically, the Constitutional Union Party wanted to preserve the Union. When it's all said and done, Abraham Lincoln wins with 180 electoral college votes. Um, he gets almost 2 million popular votes as well. Now, after the election, uh, some people knew that things were about to get really bad. Senator John Crittenden of Kentucky, he proposes that the Missouri Compromise Line be reinstituted and the Southern governments and the Southern representatives were okay with that. But the Northern congressmen say, absolutely not. This is our chance to end the idea of slavery. South Carolina is going to secede from the Union on December 20th, 1860. And by February 1st of 1861, all of the states listed there have seceded from the Union. Now, it's important to know Abraham Lincoln does not become president until March 4th. So all of this is happening before Lincoln is president. The Confederate government is formed. It's basically a copy paste from the U.S. Constitution. Uh, the biggest differences are the right to own slaves is constitutionally protected. The presidential term limit is going to be six years instead of four. And there's the line item veto, which means that the president can change laws as he would like. Jefferson Davis is going to be elected the president and Alexander Stevens is going to be elected the vice president. Now moving on to the Civil War, I've got about 15 minutes to cover this to keep it under 30. Uh, same thing. I'm not going to go over everything, but I'm going to kind of just hit the highlights. Um, as far as going over everything, you've got the book and you've got the PowerPoint to do. Now, just a real quick comparison. This is North versus South. And I want you to notice that the North had the advantage in everything. It had the advantage in population, manufacturing, transportation. The North had the South beaten everything. But the South is going to use the inspiration of the American Revolution to um, be like, hey, we can win this. We can do this. Both sides have pretty strong leadership. The leaders of both armies have been trained in either combat at the Mexican-American War 
or in the classroom at West Point or some combination of the two. Neither the North or the, th the South thought that the war was going to last very long. And there's two different styles. The South just wants to outlast the North while the North wants to make the South submit. And the South comes up, or I'm sorry, the North comes up with the idea of the Anaconda Plan, which is going to squeeze the life out of the Confederacy. And you can see there the three parts that are going to make up the Anaconda Plan. Here's your list of Confederate states. The only thing really of note here is Virginia. When Virginia secedes from the Union, uh, several western counties of Virginia secede from the state. And that is where the state of West Virginia comes from. Those are parts of Virginia that did not want to join the Confederacy. Maryland, Kentucky, Missouri, these are three border states. They are slave states that remain with the Union. Uh, Maryland is going to become um, under control of the U.S. Army. Kentucky is going to be invaded by the Confederacy. And Missouri is going to fight amongst itself and get taken over by the Union. This is how the armies were joined. The first thing that happens is that the people have to choose to fight. Um, and there's different reasons. Some of them believe in the different causes. Uh, some of them are going to um, look for adventure. And then some of them are going to say, I have to fight. I have to do this to become a man. Once that's done, once you decide to fight, then you have to muster into the army. Um, volunteers are raised. Uh, usually somebody important and prominent throughout the, the area raises a group, then officers are elected, and then once enough men have been volunteered, a company is formed and they go off to, uh, to training. Once the troops are mustered, then the troops are outfitted with weapons, gears, supply, um, uniforms, and then training happens last but not least. And I want you to notice that this, the soldiers go to state training camps. So each state has their own individual training camp and each state is going to train their, their soldiers a little bit differently, which makes it really, really hard for the different states and the troops from different states to work together. Your first battle is July 21st, 1861, is the Battle of Manassas. It happens about 30 miles from Washington, D.C. It is going to be a Confederate victory, and it causes panic in the North because they were not expecting to lose. Almost as soon as the war starts, it becomes a naval battle. Uh, the Union, because they want to blockade the southern ports and control the ocean, uh, they take over Port Royal, South Carolina, Fort Pulaski in, in Savannah, and they even take over New Orleans in April of 1862. And slowly but surely, all the different port cities and all the different ways to get goods in or out of the Confederacy are clamped down by the Union. In 1862, in February of 1862, Nashville is forced to surrender when the two forts protecting the city fall to the Union Army and General Ulysses S. Grant. After the loss of Nashville, the Confederate Army is going to retreat to southern Tennessee uh, near Savannah, Tennessee, which is like South Central, and the Battle of Shiloh is going to happen where there are 23,000 casualties in less than a day of fighting. Those are more people killed or injured than in any and all conflicts the United States had had up to that point combined. It is a very, very bloody day in American history. Uh, Virginia has fighting as well. Uh, Virginia, specifically Richmond, that's where the Confederate capital is. And the Union Army, very early on, is going to try and capture Richmond. Uh, they are not successful. They do fail. But this 
month-long battle in Virginia is very deadly as well. Over 35,000 casualties in June of 1862 in the wilderness of Virginia. The fall of 1862, if the Confederacy was going to win, that was its best chance. The fall of 1862 was the only time that the Confederacy was con um, powerful enough and in control enough to launch two separate and independent invasions of the North. Now, ultimately, neither invasion works. Both invasions have to retreat, but that is generally speaking, the high point of the Confederacy. Some political de developments. Um, financing the war doesn't go so well for the South. Um, they're going to print treasury notes that are um, not really worth anything. Basically, they're trading IOUs. And the only way the Confederate money will become worth anything is if they win the war. The Union passes the Legal Tender Act, which authorized the creation and printing of dollar bills known as greenbacks. Greenbacks were legal tender and could be spent right away. The Confederate money were IOUs that wouldn't become valuable until two years after the war was over. Uh, because of the insecurity about money, the South has food riots, runaway inflation, and it's just not a good time financially in the South. The Confederacy is going to try and get recognition from foreign countries, and the South is going to try and sell their cotton in exchange for help in the war. Unfortunately for the Confederacy, this idea of selling cotton doesn't work simply because in the 10 years period, uh, the South produced so much cotton that it was just in warehouses and Europe didn't need anything. Uh, once it became clear that this cotton diplomacy was going to fail, the Confederacy then just turned to straight economics saying, hey, Britain, France, um, with this blockade, we can't buy stuff from you. If you help us lift the blockade, we'll make you our exclusive trading partner. Well, uh, Europe is going to say, you know what? We sell enough stuff to the Union. We really don't need your business, too. And the idea of getting outside recognition and outside help, it just doesn't happen. And the Confederacy knows at that point that it is going to uh, have a slow, slow defeat. By 1862, new recruits are needed for both armies, and both the Confederacy and the Union are going to pass conscription, which is basically forced enlistment. Uh, one exception, though, is in the North, if you had enough money to pay somebody to take your place, you could. And so in the Union, very often, this was called a rich man's war and a poor man's fight because it was more and more of the... Uh, the lower class doing the fighting and the rich were staying home. There are peace movements too. In the Confederacy, uh, the mountainous areas of Georgia, Kentucky, Tennessee, North Carolina, South Carolina, even Alabama, um, they're going to turn against the Confederacy. And even, especially in Tennessee, Soldiers are going to be raised to fight for the Union instead of the Confederacy. In the Union, there's the Copperhead Movement. Uh, these are anti-war Democrats who are going to attempt to, uh, to defeat the Republicans in various elections and stop the war. Uh, one of the best examples of this is the Ohio candidate for governor. His name was Clement Vallandigham. Clement Vallandigham is going to run for governor, uh, get arrested for being seen as anti-war and anti-union. Uh, he's going to get banished to the Confederacy. He's not a Confederate. He is a unionist who just wants the war to end. And the Confederacy is going to banish him to Canada. And while he's in Canada, he continues to run for the governorship of Ohio. 
Southern women are going to turn against the Confederacy as well. Uh, Southern women were asked to sacrifice their men, give their men equipment and uh, clothing, give their men moral and spiritual support. And in exchange, women are expecting protection, the bare minimum basic needs, and news as to how the war is going. Well, when the Confederacy begins to not share the news of how bad the war is going, uh, when the women can't get the basic needs and basic foods that they are looking for, and when the, the uh, Confederacy can't even guarantee the safety of the women, they turn against the government, start telling their men to come home and stop fighting, and they'll even go and free prisoners of war and hide them. So the women start actively working against the Confederacy in many cases. And then we have the Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863. Very often, if you ask somebody what the Emancipation Proclamation did, they're going to say, oh, it freed the slaves. It didn't. The Emancipation Proclamation was purely a political document released by Lincoln to change the meaning of the war and give the war more support. When you read the proclamation of 17, or the proclamation of the Emancipation Proclamation, not the proclamation of 1763, that's many weeks ago. When you read the Emancipation Proclamation, you're going to notice that it only applied to places under Confederate control. And places under Confederate control, Lincoln had no say so over. So the Emancipation Proclamation, it's purely a political document to get people to uh, support the war. Now, what happens in the late Civil War? Um, there are two battles, Vicksburg and Gettysburg. Uh, make sure you know those two. Uh, they happen on basically on the same week. Vicksburg surrenders on July 4th, 1863. Gettysburg, uh, the Confederate Army is defeated on July 3rd, 1863. Put them together. Those are two very, very big defeats in the same week for the Confederate Army. This is like the beginning of the end right here. The Atlanta campaign is going to happen in 1864. General Sherman is going to slowly march all the way from Chattanooga to Atlanta. Uh, battles happen basically all along where I-75 is. And the whole idea is to take over Atlanta, which was a major railroad hub. Like today, you can fly out of Hartsfield, Jackson, and go anywhere in the world. Well, back then, you could take a train and go basically anywhere out of Atlanta. Once Atlanta is captured, William Sherman is going to uh, realize that he has to defeat not just the armies of the South, but he has to defeat the spirit of the South, too. And he and about 60,000 of his closest friends are going to march all the way from Atlanta to Savannah. Savannah is surrendered without a shot. There is no battle in Savannah. And Sherman is going to present Abraham Lincoln, the city of Savannah, as a Christmas gift in 1864. So how does the war end? Well, it ends with General Lee and General Grant chasing each other throughout Virginia. Once the city of Petersburg falls to the Union in March of 1865, um, that was one of the major cities that protected Richmond. So very shortly after Petersburg is taken over by the Union Army, Richmond has to be abandoned. And Grant finally catches up to Lee outside of a city called Appomattox Courthouse. And when Lee realizes he is sur surrounded he is going to surrender to Grant on April 9th. Now, it's important to know April 9th is not the end of the Civil War. The Civil War is officially going to end in 1866. Um, but this is the end of the major fighting. There is still some fighting that happens after Lee surrenders, but it's much, much less than before. I also want to make sure you know Abraham Lincoln is assassinated April 14th of 1865 by a guy named John Wilkes Booth. Lincoln is assassinated before the war is technically over. Lincoln never sees peace. From the moment he's president to the moment he 
is assassinated, the country is at war. All right, so that's 30 minutes. I promised I'd get this done in 30 minutes because I want to make sure you watch it. Two things for you. Number one, if you send me an email saying that you watched this video, you do not have to do your quiz for this week. If you send me an email and you tell me, hey, I watched your video, uh, you only have to do discussion 13, discussion 14, and quiz 14. I will not make you do quiz 13 if you send me an email and say, hey, I watched your video. I also want to make sure that you know reflection paper number three is due this week and the museum review is due next week. So if you have not yet gone to a museum, you need to do that sometime in the next two weeks. If you have any questions about the museum review or if you need help picking a museum, send me an email. I will be more than happy to help you come up with something. All right, that is it as promised right about 30 minutes. I appreciate your time watching this and I hope you learned a little bit. And um, any questions, send me an email. We'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.